timer. <laughs> well, uh, thank you, Dean Rutherford, and um, thank you, Tazira, for that uh, wonderful welcome. And I'd also like to thank all of you for being here today and taking time out of your schedules uh, to hear what I've learned um, from this class of 2002 from West Point, um, and just to tell you a little bit about them and, and their stories. Um, it's appropriate, I suppose, to be here talking about this book today, uh, Veterans Day being yesterday. And um, especially when people see the connection that I had to Bob Woodward, I get a lot of questions on how did this book come about. So I'd like to tell you that to begin with. Um, in a Time of War was, as I say, it was actually born in a footnote in a memo that I wrote to Bob Woodward in January or February of 2005. Now, at the time, I was actually on active duty in the Army. I was called up as a JAG officer, and I was looking for a job. And I'd heard that Bob Woodward hired a research assistant for every book that he does, and I wanted that job. Uh, I was fortunate enough to get an interview, and part of the process of going to work for Bob Woodward, he has you critique his previous book, tell him what you think he could do better. Um, and the previous book in that case was called Plan of Attack, and it's about President Bush's decision to go to war in Iraq. Well, I'd actually read it when it came out, but this time, of course, I read it with a closer eye. And I focused on a particular moment in that book. Uh, the moment was June 1st, 2002, and it's the date when President Bush outlined um, the Bush Doctrine, or the Preemption Doctrine, the notion that um, the United States would pro proclaim its policy to uh, take military action against other states before their threats against us have fully materialized. Well, the reason, I mean, besides the obvious reason, um, but the reason that really struck me was that President Bush gave that speech at West Point to the graduates in the class of 2002. And I guess because I was still wearing a uniform myself, I stepped back and said, wow. Um, here you've got the president giving what is, by, all, by any definition, an historic speech. And he chooses to give it you know, not in front of political supporters somewhere or at a civilian college. He chooses to give this speech to brand new lieutenants who will be carrying out the policy that he implies that day. And I thought a little bit more about this class of 2002. They're, they started West Point in 1998, which of course is the Clinton years. It's, um, it's a time of peace. It's a time when a hardship tour in the Army is six months in Bosnia. Um, and 9-11 happens in September of their senior year, what they call their first year at West Point. And, you know, we say it's a cliche, 9-11 changed everything, but certainly for them, that moment, they could see how their destinies were going to change. And the final thing I thought was that, you know, from what I knew about West Point, I'd never actually been there when I started this book, but from what I knew about it, from my, what I knew about being in the Army, you know, I know as a young officer, you're taught that the pinnacle of leadership, the, the real test of leadership for any young American is if you can be one of those few who is fortunate enough to be called to lead troops in combat. Well, it struck me that we had a generation of West Pointers um, who, because of the timing of when they went to West Point, never actually led troops in combat. I mean, that's a good thing. Why, you know, we didn't have wars, so by and large, so they didn't lead troops in combat. But now we had this one class and those after them that it struck me, wow, they are going to be the ones who are going to lead troops in combat again and again. So bringing it back to this memo that I wrote to Woodward, I said, you know, A, you should hire me. B, you should write another book about Iraq. And in a footnote, I said, wouldn't it be great if we could track down some of these lieutenants who were there that day, June 1st, 02, and have a little subplot in the book where, you know, we did the, the, give the Woodward treatment to the Washington Baghdad book about, about decisions of power, but we could illustrate how these things actually played out at the lowest levels of the Army. Well, um, I got the job. And, <clears throat> pardon me, I, uh, I left the Army on a Friday and went to work for Bob Woodward on a Monday, um, probably something that hasn't happened before. And, um, you know, literally I think that first day when, uh, you know, I actually worked out of Bob's house in Georgetown, um, I think that first day it was sort of, you know, have a cup of coffee, the bathroom's down the hall. Your first assignment is to follow up on that footnote that you wrote. And I remember him using the words total immersion. First day on the job, of course, I'm going to dive in. You know, I'd never been to West Point, and I didn't know anyone in the class or have any contact info, but we're not going to worry about those little details. 
Bob Woodward just told me, total immersion, so I'm going to go do it. Um, and I dove in, and I started doing interviews. And you know, for those first couple of months, I was you know, doing many, many projects. And it, as it happened, um, events overtook this. And this so, almost might have fallen by the wayside um, because we had so many other things going on in a book that eventually became State of Denial, came out in uh, October of 06. Um, except for a couple of things. Uh, one, I kind of became obsessed with this story, which I think is a key to success. Um, and two, I had, I had developed a relationship of trust with a few of the people in this class. Um, I think I'd indicated to them that I was going to take the time to get to know them and know their stories right. Um, and that I didn't have any real agenda except to find out what life had been like for them. And as a result, some of them started to contact me. And there's just no way, even when you don't think it's going to amount to anything uh, in terms of a book, there's just no way you don't take that call and, and ask the questions and want to know more. Um, I'm going to tell you a, just a, a little bit more about the background on this. I wound up doing, uh, I think I counted 619 interviews. Uh, and that doesn't count, you know, quick little email back and forth and telephone call, but 619 real interviews. And that's a lot of interviews. Um, and I did it part-time while I was working for Bob and then full-time uh, afterwards and came out recently. Now, I tell you all that uh, not so much to try to impress you with what a hard worker I am, um, but just hopefully to provide a little bit of evidence that, um, you know, it's impossible to represent the feelings of everybody in the army or everybody in the military or even everybody in this class. But I, do, I, I did go out and do the work and do have some evidence to point to when I tell you about the conclusions that I reached later on. Um, I actually really, really, really got to know some of these people better than I know some of my best friends and I think better than some of their best friends knew them. Uh, and when the book finally came out, in some cases I had the wives in every case that I'm thinking of, it was a male soldier. So the wives contacting me and saying, thank you for forcing my husband to answer these questions over the years because he probably never would have talked about these things uh, for years and years. Um, and that, you know, it's a little bit humbling to me. It was at the time, and, and, and I, I struggle with this question, why are they talking, talking to me so much? I mean, um, you know, I, maybe I'm a very good reporter and I can get people to do it, but I thought there was something deeper, why people would talk to me for, you know, many hours, dozens of hours in some cases. And sometimes I'm not even sure they knew why. But that was a question, you know, I'm, I'm working on my next book, which is about the Harvard Business School, and I don't always have the same question. I mean, they'll talk, and I know why, because, you know, they think they have a good story and they're confident. And I think some of them see that it probably won't be a bad thing career-wise if they wind up profiled in a book. But that's not necessarily the case in the Army. It's not a, an organization that, by and large, respects self-promotion. So I really wondered why. So let, let's hold on to that question, why, for a minute, because I held on to it for three years. So we can, we can hold on to it for a couple of minutes in the speech here. Um, just a few other quick points. Um, I've been looking for a while for a accounting of just how many American soldiers have served in Iraq and Afghanistan. And it's um, surprisingly hard to come by that number, but the best estimates I've seen are between one and a half and 1.7 million Americans. Um, I guess we're, we're not, you know, fortunately we're not quite there, but we're approaching um, the ballpark of 5,000 total killed in action, Iraq and Afghanistan, going back to September 2001. <coughs> Pardon me. Again, it's an estimate, but roughly, uh, this might be a little bit outdated, but roughly 30,000 wounded. Um, and I, I throw all these numbers out because, you know, there are only 1,000 in the class, and I interviewed however many, but with those restraints, I really was trying to write as much as I could about what the experience is of at least a young American soldier in the, uh, the current um, army. So by and large, this book is about people, it's about individuals, and as a result of that, um, I, I can't tell you about everybody who's in the book right now, but I'd like to tell you about just a couple of them. Um, <clears throat> I was actually very closely following two dozen characters at one point, meaning talking to them at least every couple of weeks, emails back and forth. And that, that's a very large number. I knew they wouldn't all end up in the book, but it's because the story was still happening, and I didn't know who's, who was going to wind up in it. But in the final version, we wind up generally with um, the stories of two groups of friends, really. 
I'm just going to tell you briefly about a couple of the people. I'll, I'll mention four of them, I guess, <clears throat> who are in those two groups. Um, the first group is called, they're called the Ducks. Uh, and they're called the Ducks simply because they were in company D1, cadet company D1 at West Point, and that was their mascot. They go to football games, and they always have to have one person dress up in a big, white, fluffy duck costume. Uh, <laughs> And believe me, actually, Duck is a fairly fortunate mascot <laughs> compared to what some of the others had to, had to dress up in. Um, the first of the Ducks I'm going to mention is a guy named Will Tucker. And Will, in a lot of ways, is what I expected I was going to find when I started this book. Um, he's from a small town in Alabama. If you ask him or his parents why he went to West Point, a lot of it was, well, you know, because it was free, because he was smart, it was a good education, but this was, this was his opportunity at a top flight education. And when I talk about that perfect timing of leading troops in combat, he's what I expected I'd find. He, um, he was an armor officer, meaning a tanker, and he wound up serving three combat tours. And his first one was barely seven months after, well, he, he got to his unit and got his orders, barely seven months after that graduation speech. Saw as much combat as anybody I've known of in the class of 2002 or frankly, compared to most army officers that I've known of. A total, I believe, of 37 months. Um, but he, at the same time, he's a very tough, quiet, reserved guy. He's not, you know, it took a lot to get Will to talk. Um, the next member of the Ducks I'd just like to mention real briefly is a woman named Trisha LaRue Birdsell. Um, it, was, it was important to me to look for at least one female person to follow in this book because I thought that's an important story and it often doesn't get told in books about war, but almost 10% of this class was female. Um, Trisha is typical in one manner that she had military tradition in her family. A lot of West Pointers are the offspring of, if not other West Pointers, at least other army officers and soldiers. Um, but what's unusual about her is that the, tr the tradition in her family was passed by, from her mother down to her. Her father was not in the military, but her mom is still actually a colonel in the Army Nurse Corps. Uh, she was a long-distance swimmer, still holds a, rest, uh, a, uh, a record at West Point, if I'm not mistaken, um, and wound up in the Medical Service Corps, running a battalion aid station, basically, but uh, married a classmate. So she served in Iraq at the same time as her classmate. Um, she served only one tour so far, uh, but it was a very, you know, there was a lot of action and drama in that tour, shall we say. And um, she was very easy to write about because so much, she'd been through so much and also thought a lot about what she'd been through. Um, and the other thing about Trisha is that she's actually one of uh, a minority, but a sizable minority, who have decided to make the Army a career. And I wanted that represented in the book as well. The third of four characters I'm just going to mention today um, is the guy who's sort of the centerpiece of the ducks in the book and I think in real life. Uh, his name is Todd Bryant. Uh, Todd was, in fact, from a military family. Parents were Air Force officers, one brother who was a Marine officer, and one sister who was actually two years ahead of him at West Point. Um, Todd's a funny, funny guy. I mean, just hilarious. Comes out with things left and right that would just leave everybody in stitches. Mischief mischievous, um, always in trouble. And he has, he's a paradox of he's not what people would refer to as, um, you know, he's not a super trooper. He's not a, uh, you know, 7% body fat running the three miles in 18 minutes type of guy. He's, you saw, if you saw Todd walking down the street with his hair a little long and kind of a spare tire around his, his stomach, you might not think he was even in the Army. And he, that was a constant struggle for him. But paradoxically, great combat leader. And I know this because I went and talked to almost every soldier who served under him to ask what was it like under Lieutenant Bryant. Um, now, unfortunately, which is an understatement, uh, but In a Time of War is a book about war, and in real time, bad things happen, including people that I was writing about not surviving the war. Todd was actually killed in action, and the result of that is that, you know, the story of the ducks is basically a story of sacrifice and resilience, and it's about how do a group of friends continue going back to serve over and over again when they've seen firsthand that one of their closest friends didn't make it back. Um, is that me making that interference there? Okay. Well, the fourth of the four people I'm going to mention to you today, he's very, very important in the book, and he's also from Arkansas, so it seemed uh, very appropriate to mention him. This is a young guy named Drew Sloan, and there's no pithy nickname for Drew's friends, so I just call him Drew and Friends, which I'm sure Drew gets a kick out of. Um, 
Drew actually grew up in Fayetteville. His dad's a professor at the University of Arkansas down there. He's a very smart guy. Um, he was an infantry officer. And he led what I think he would freely admit was kind of a charmed life. Um, graduated high enough in his class that he was able to be stationed in Hawaii. Um, happened to get there right at the height of, or, or uh, on the upswing of the real estate boom. So got into buying and selling real estate and making quite a lot of money while he was serving in the army. Um, no military tradition, and in fact, uh, Drew Sloan says the first he ever heard of West Point uh, was from reading a Tom Clancy novel when he was in high school. <laughs> um, but all of Drew's life changed on October 10th, 2004, on a very desolate road in Afghanistan, the day after the first free Afghan elections, when he and his platoon were transporting ballots from a very small village to a larger one where they could be flown off. And um, a guy whose name he never knew, uh, who nobody ever saw, um, hit his armored RPV with a ro ro armored Humvee with a rocket-propelled grenade. Uh, every bone in Drew's face was broken. He woke up days later in Walter Reed, uh, wounded, clearly wounded badly enough that they offered him a medical discharge. Uh, Drew turned it down, and went through a year of recovery, knowing he wasn't going to make a, a career of the Army, but went through a, a, career, a, a year of recovery anyway, um, so that he would be able to get back to his unit in time to deploy for, to Iraq for a year. And that really struck me when I learned that, and I wanted to know why. So I had a lot of these questions. Why did they talk to me? Why does Drew go back to Iraq? And, you know, it's funny, because I spent three years working on this book, and sometimes you can't see the forest for the trees. So when I finished it, I was fortunate enough to be able to step back and reread my own book. And, you know, you try and boil down a few years of your life into 20-minute talks like this, and sometimes it takes a while to do it. But, um, you know, I kept asking myself, what's this book really about? What can I talk about? What's it really about? It's about a few things, obviously. It's about war, right? It's about leadership in West Point. Um, it struck me that it's kind of about the millennial generation, because um, that's mostly when these people were born, 1980. I think that's pretty much squarely in that, that category. But the biggest theme is something that is so fundamental that I didn't actually see it till the end. Um, I'm going to explain by example, and I'll tell you my eureka moment. Uh, I was down at Fort Benning giving a talk like this very early on, and I got to go out to dinner with a 1999 West Point graduate. So a little bit older than the class I wrote about, but very much the same experiences. Two tours in Iraq, very rough, lots of combat, had the experience, I believe, of soldiers under his command who didn't come home alive and had to, had to deal with that. Um, and, you know, we talked a lot about how even when he's home in garrison, which is what it's called when you're back, back in base in the States, um, you know, he's got a wife and two kids, but he doesn't see them that often because it's still a pretty hard job, and there are still weeks when you're not at home and you're out in the field and things like that. Now, nevertheless, this guy had just recently committed, um, almost certainly that he'd be in the Army for at least 20 years. He took a few incentives that he owed more time. And, and, and I asked him, you know, why? We've just gone through talking about how hard this is. Why are you choosing to stay in? And he kind of leaned back and he said, you know, it's because I love Joe. Now, Joe, if you don't know, is pretty much the officer's slang for any enlisted soldier. And it's often used in a... Um, you know, kind of a knucklehead sense, like there's Joe again, that's what Joe does, that type of thing. But he said, you know, it was early on in his second tour and he realized these are the people I want to be around. I love Joe so much. So I thought about this and being a somewhat um, analytical person, being a lawyer previous to this, I wanted to come up with some proof. Like is my book, you know, what's my book really about? What's he telling me here? So I took the entire text of my book and has anyone ever used a word cloud? Do you know what a word cloud is? Word cloud is software. It's, you can find them on the web. Um, you just cut and paste text in it, and it'll give you a graphical representation of which words are most prominent in it. So I took the entire 300,000 words, whatever it is in my book, and put it in a, a web uh, word cloud software. And it took about 10 minutes probably to spit it back to me, but it gave me all these pretty pictures of, of my book. And it, you know, you'd see the words you'd expect, war in big letters, and Iraq in big letters, and people's names. But the one that kind of surprised me, although by now I thought it was going to be there, the word was love. It was big. I thought, wow, okay. Well, because although these people, you know, they don't use the word love all that often. They're, you know, manly men, that type of thing. But um, I think I cracked the code. 
and I thought about, well, what really motivates all these people? Okay, patriotism, love of their country, love of their soldiers, and I thought of all these officers that I'd written about that I'd met that had told me time and again how many risks they took, things they weren't really sure they were going to live through because that's how they'd accomplish their mission, but more importantly, that would increase the chance that their soldiers would, would survive. Um, I thought of Todd Bryant, who I mentioned, the sort of centerpiece of the ducks. Five years ago this week, had his funeral at Arlington National Cemetery. And I know, because I talked to everyone who was with him, that he knew exactly the danger he was getting into, that he was putting himself in, the morning he got up, got in the Humvee, gave the order, and drove through a certain sector where people had been attacked time and time and again. Um, he did it anyway because he cared so much for the soldiers under him, and he's going to be there with them. And I thought of another guy named Joe De Silva, who's in the book. Joe, great guy. Class president of the class of 2002. In March 2003, he got to his unit, well, a little bit before that, but in March 2003, he got to Kuwait with his unit. And he's the brand new lieutenant, so he's just sort of a staff officer, everybody's assistant. And at the last minute, they give him a platoon, just days before the invasion. So the first time he sits down with his brand new soldiers, who are now, frankly, scared to death that they've got this brand new untested lieutenant about to lead them into combat, he says, look, I admit, you know, I don't know much. I'm going to learn from you people. And I don't know what awaits us on the other side of that berm, but I'll tell you this. If I have to give my life for any of you, I will do it in a heartbeat. And that's the first thing he says to his soldiers. And again, I talked to some of them that said, you know, at the time we were actually thinking of tying him up and putting him, putting him in the back of a Humvee. <laughs> but after that speech and after he demonstrated that a little bit, they trusted him. And, and you know, he was young, but that, that's the spirit. That's it. So, you know, I think Joe actually, you know, fortunately survived that tour, didn't have to give up his life for anyone. And then he survived another tour. And today, Actually, within a couple days of today, he's actually going to finish his third 15-month tour. He's now a company commander in Mosul, um, and it's unusual. He's actually in the same brigade that he was in back that day. He gave that speech five and a half years ago, but he's still with his soldiers. So it, this, that, in turn, got me thinking a lot about if these people serve because of love for themselves, you know, for, for their fellow soldiers, for us, what do we actually owe them in return? Um, and I, I don't really like the phrase support the troops just because it gets used so much, but really I guess that's what I'm asking is what should we be doing to support the troops? Now, so again, you know, this book is, my, my voice I tried to keep out of this book. My thoughts, you know, not my thoughts, but my, I, I kept my politics out of it. I wanted their story. So I thought, well, if I'm going to start talking about this, I don't want to just say what I think we should do to support the troops. I want to say what the troops think we should do to support the troops. And it occurred to me that as a result of writing this book, I had something like at least several hundred email addresses of young army officers. So I sent a few global emails saying, I'm going to give these speeches. I'm going to write on this. You tell me, what should I pass along? What should civilians be doing to support the troops? Um, I can tell you straight off that they're not too high on those yellow bumper, uh, ribbon bumper stickers, but, uh, <laughs> but you know, I, I got a ton of different answers, but I think I can boil it down into three important categories that hopefully we can take something away with. Um, first off, I think they want civilians to find a way to serve. I, I guess this is kind of an appropriate and affirming message to give at uh, the School of, uh, of Public Service, but it's what they told me. They, they recognize we don't need 10 million soldiers, but we need millions of Americans who are eager to serve their country in other ways. Um, I, I, again, I kept partisan out of the, partisanship out of the book, but I'm wondering, has anyone in this room looked at change.gov on the internet? Right? Well, if you go there, you'll see you know, it's Obama's transition um, website. And one thing that struck me as I was looking through it at the behest of my wife um, was a section on national service in which um, they list a number of different corps that they'd like to establish. They describe expanding the Peace Corps and AmeriCorps, but also creating a classroom corps, a clean energy corps, a health corps, and a veterans corps. I don't really know the details, but I'm guessing that if this is for real and actually really means something, then it will resonate with some of these people that I heard from. Um, the unusual thing about military service is that a great deal of it is performed physically and geographically separate from the society on whose behalf it's performed. And so they don't often get to see 
and think, I think, of, uh, of other people serving in other ways as doing something comparable or in the same sphere as what they're doing. And another way to put this is, you know, we see soldiers walking through the airport. Some of us might say, you know, thank you for your service, welcome home. But we're pretty unlikely to do that to, you know, nurses and teachers and inventors. But I think they see that, the ones I heard from anyway, they, they see those as being in the same sphere. And, you know, they want to serve, but they're, they're counting on the rest of their fellow Americans as, kind of, as part of the deal to find a way to serve as well. So that's the first notion. The first of three is serve. Um, the second that I heard again and again is that they want Americans to exercise their rights. Uh, Todd Bryant, who I got to know so well, unfortunately, due to his death, uh, uh, or, you know what I'm trying to say, um, uh, but I got to know him very well in the course of writing about him. I was struck by the number of times he would quote Voltaire, or actually, I'm not sure this is a Voltaire quote, but Todd thought it was. Uh, the quote, <laughs> I disapprove of what you say, but I will defend to the death your right to say it. I actually always thought that was Voltaire too until I started really uh, studying this, but you know, I, I, it came up again and again and again. And, you know, what I heard from all these people is they want fellow citizens to speak their minds, vote their informed conscience, um, you know, question their government. Um, and, you know, I was asked this question before, and I'm, I'm certainly not going to pretend that I found that, you know, the military was now split 50-50 between Republicans and Democrats. There were a lot of McCain supporters, certainly. But by and large, I think the level of enthusiasm and participation in the most recent election just last week was probably heartening. Um, I definitely heard that from a few people. Um, and I always, you know, I get this, asked this question all the time, and I suppose everyone has their own answer, but the question, you know, can you support the troops without supporting the war? My answer is absolutely yes, you can. There are two different questions. Not everyone will agree with me in that in this group. I, I think I would, I would see a split. But I would, paradoxically, I think they would generally agree that troops are counting on their citizens, or our citizens, to voice opposition to wars or even just missions that aren't worthy of them. That's why I think it's so important that they are two different questions. Well, the most, that was the second of three, and the most important fundamental thing I heard from these soldiers over and over again is that if civilians want to support the troops, the basic, most bottom line thing they have to do is pay attention to the troops. Um, you know, a year and a half ago, I guess it was, I think we were all kind of embarrassed when we learned how some of the wounded warriors of the United States were being treated or not treated well enough at Walter Reed. I, I think before that we weren't paying close enough attention to what was going on there, otherwise we wouldn't have put up with it. And I like, I like to lead off this, with this example because here, you know, I'm a guy who was in the Army, I was a former JAG officer, um, I've been writing about the Iraq War for many years, and I live within a few miles of Walter Reed, and you know, if there's anybody who could have screamed bloody murder from the outside, so to speak, it's probably me. So that's why I lead off with this, I don't excuse myself. Um, but there are many other examples, you know, I think a few years ago we were sending a lot of soldiers into harm's way without the proper equipment that they needed, you know. Um, armored Humvees, of course, uh, modern body armor, and the whole MRAP program, which I could give another speech on. <laughs> but I think, you know, if we really looked at all these men and women as really our brothers and sisters, our sons and daughters, would we have accepted that situation? Or would, you know, I, I think there's absolutely a, an inclination to say, well, the experts are in charge, they know what they're doing. But I don't think that we would have done that if we really thought of them as a whole, as a society, as our brothers and sisters. Um, and I also wonder, how did we on the outside kind of stand by and let our soldiers go to war at the start of this in Iraq without the planning and the doctrine and the strategy that they would have needed to be successful, regardless of whether you thought it was a good idea for the country to go to war to begin with in Iraq, but we went in, obviously, and I, if there are any Army officers who disagree with this, I'd love to hear from them, BillMurphyJr. at gmail.com, and I've been looking for you, but we went in without a winning strategy and we stuck with it for years. Um, and why? I think because those on the outside who could have said something, um, and sometimes did, but didn't, clearly didn't say it strongly enough to force the change. And, and you know, I mean, we've made drastic improvements in some of these particular areas, and I just, I just pulled them out. But um, by and large, I think the problem was that uh, we didn't pay enough attention. Um, I'm going to 
pull back on the kudos from a minute ago about how great the election was last week, because I, w I think the one thing that is disheartening to people that I heard from is how Iraq and Afghanistan completely disappeared as issues in the closing months of the campaign. And I know it's an aphorism that Americans vote with their pocketbooks, with their wallets, um, and you know we all know what happened in September. But I think it's disheartening to go overseas for 12, 15 months, um, regardless of whether you're in intense combat or not, but come back and recognize that people have more or less kind of forgotten that we're there and doing anything. Um, so, you know, of course, it wasn't always like this. If we think back seven years ago, after 9-11, um, people wanted to serve. I seem to recall the Red Cross saying they didn't need any more blood donations at the time. Couldn't handle any more in New York City. Um, and the soldiers I've talked to realized that despite everyone wanting to serve, the answer that people got, civilians by and large, was kind of thanks but no thanks. You know, um, live your lives, hug your children, fly and enjoy America's great destination spots, get down to Disney World in Florida. Obviously, that's kind of an easy target in retrospect. Um, and there is, you know, I do acknowledge there was some legitimate rationale for that, because if we're going to fight a war against terrorism, there's an argument that if we're even paying attention to terrorists, we're giving them small victories. But, you know, there's a cost, and I think all these people recognize that. It's not just in treasure or in efficiency, it's in the soul of our nation. So, I think most of us, certainly people in this room, certainly people um, that I've been privileged to talk to as a result of talking about this book, I do hear a loud chorus of people who want to know, you know, what exactly can I be doing? What, you know, how can we put this together? How, how can I actually, you know, it's one thing to say pay attention, but how do I um, concretely do that? And I don't have all the answers, of course, but I do think that one thing that I hear people clamoring for is some sort of national conversation on service and sacrifice and going forward, you know, all the challenges we face. What can ordinary Americans who aren't going to quit their jobs and leave their families and go off and live monastic lives of service, but what can they do in their lives to, pr to uh, improve upon sort of our national efforts, not just in Iraq, not just in Afghanistan, but in so many different areas. But I think it's really important. I think that's the bottom line way that we support the troops because when we ask young men and women to go overseas and to risk and sometimes give their lives in the process, we make a commitment. And we tell them that we've got their backs. And if we don't follow in, if we don't follow on our end of the deal, then I think we risk making fools of them. And the worst part about that to me is that we risk just breaking their hearts. So with that, I'll be happy to take any questions that you have. We do have time for some questions, so if you raise your hand, we'll get a microphone to you, and we'll start in the middle. Um, I was wondering if, um, you know, through all your interviews, if um, after someone served the requisite amount of time that's, requ you know, that's required after graduation, if anybody left the, the service, they didn't make a, you know, a career out of it, they didn't re-up, and um, what the reasons might have been. Sure, yeah. Um, the, the question was whether they stayed in or whether they got out. and. Um, a majority got out, but that's not new. That's not new since 9-11. Since that's um, going back at least to the early 80s, maybe even before that, that a majority do get out after uh, just five years or seven years if they have, uh, you know, if they train to be helicopter pilots and the like. Um, I, I, think, I think by and large, actually, the numbers haven't changed all that much, the percentages anyway, from the pre-Iraq era. Uh, but what has changed is that we probably need more to stay in than we did before because we have a much higher operational tempo and we need a lot more um, officers, we need a lot more soldiers. Um, you know, the reasons that I hear, the, the number one reason has been the repeated deployments, just the time away from family. If people don't have families yet, they're, you know, heck, for the single soldiers, the time away from dating. I mean, there's not a lot of dating going on in, uh, in Iraq. Um, it, 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 it's a... Uh, and, and I guess that's, you know, that's always been the case somewhat because a lot of military bases, they're not lo lo located in, you know, large metropolitan areas and especially now where, you, where, where um, military couples, you know, where they are married, generally the non-military non spouse wants to have a career 
which is not always possible when you know military bases are in isolated areas and you're going to move every three years anyway. Um, but so yeah, the the number one reason people got out, I think, had to do with high operational tempo. It wasn't um, a, you know any sort of political. Uh, disagreement with the idea of being involved in Iraq or anything like that. I mean, th there was some of that, but that wasn't the, 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 the reason I heard again and again. The major reason I heard was, um, you know, I'm on my third tour, how many have you done, that sort of thing. And uh, the recognition that, it's, you know, as I say, one and a half to 1.7 million people carrying the burden for a nation of 300 million. you know the number of casualties that have been suffered by the graduates of the 2002 class? Uh, yes, um, very, you know, thankfully very low compared to previous wars. I believe in the, um, I should know this off the top of my head, tip of my tongue, and the reason I hesitate is because there were a few killed in training accidents that weren't actually considered uh, in the combat zone, but only about a dozen actually killed. Um, and it's, as I say, it's really hard to come by wounded numbers, but I think we'd be, um, reasonable to estimate about 75 out of 950 wounded. And by wounded, I mean wounded enough to be removed from the battlefield, not, not catastrophic, life-changing, but, you know, not just a scratch and return the next day. So, yeah, roughly about a dozen killed and maybe about 75 wounded. Again, out of a class of 950, so historically those are not terrible odds, although obviously it's, you know, at least a dozen tragedies. Demons? <clears throat> Hi, my name is Dimas Espinol. I'm a student here at the Clinton School. I was wondering, as their interviewer, how prepared were you to help the soldiers cope with what they went through? Well, that's a good question. Um, you know, I, I, I think a lot of times I wasn't specifically prepared to help them cope with things because, uh, you know, I'd never been in combat as a soldier. And I did go to Iraq, but just for a month as a war correspondent. So I saw a few things, but I, I, I guarantee you it's radically different to go out for a few days and then, you know, hanging out at the Holiday Inn in Kuwait than it is to 15 months straight. Um, but the one, you know, the one thing I would say is that I'm, uh, I was definitely willing to devote the time and develop the trust and just listen and not... Yeah, I think that's what I heard from them as well. I'm thinking of one person in particular that said, I don't really care if you don't think you can understand what I went through. It's if you want to help me, listen. And you know, don't immediately come back with, oh, well, that reminds me of this in my life. Just, just listen. And, uh, and, but also be willing to, you know, if, if, if you've sort of started the conversation, be willing to, to finish the conversation. You know, not, not just a sort of polite three minutes, tell me how it was, but the real, you know, hour long, two hour long type of conversations that I had. You know, obviously they all knew I had another motive in that, um, especially once the project gained momentum, I thought I was going to write a book about it. Um, but they also, you know, I, I did make a commitment that I would, I, I had a rule, of, a, a no surprises rule. So they all, th there are very, very few circumstances where anybody I think was surprised about what I'd written about them in the book. And there were certainly things they told me about that didn't go in the book because you do sort of, you know, it's not like daily journalism. I think I did sort of cross a line at some points between, you know, chronicler, journalist, on one, author on one hand, and, you know, counselor up to the point of just friend on the other, so. Do we have, we have yeah, time for one right here? Tell us about uh, what happened to uh, Drew, the, the, the young guy from Fayetteville. Sure. Um, well, Drew, is, uh, as I mentioned, he was from, from Fayetteville. And um, to summarize Drew's story, as it goes through the, as the, the whole book, he is one of the main characters. But uh, Drew, after he was injured in Afghanistan, um, wound up at Walter Reed and um, you know, went through a year of uh, uh, surgical recoveries. He wound up becoming the aide to a one-star general um, in, in charge of his division, or the assistant division commander. Uh, back in Hawaii. So he was able to go back there and contribute and do an important job even though he wasn't at least first off um, in the kind of condition to be leading troops in the field. Uh, but he did actually recover and I'll tell you kind of a funny story is that I had been talking to Drew for more than two years before we ever actually met in person. And we met in person uh, in Bakuba, Iraq. Um, he was actually 
uh, flying in with his general for a meeting at the base that I was at. And as I looked around, I just saw this uh, taller blonde guy with a 25th Infantry Division patch from a long way away. I guess I had better glasses then and uh, realized that we hadn't actually met. Um, but Drew, you know, he, he did his second tour and uh, survived it very well. It was actually fortunate for me to have a character in the book who by then was an aide to a general because if you're a reporter trying to move around Iraq, it, it helps to be able to pick up the phone and say, Captain Sloan, any chance you know of a helicopter that could get me out to such and such? But um, uh, he wound up getting out of the Army, and he is now a student at the Harvard Business School doing a joint program with the Kennedy School of Government. Um, so I don't know whether he plans to come back here or not, but uh, uh, he's, he's, he's one of those that I would say over the course of doing this book, um, you know, I, I, I told the hard truths about him, no surprises, but at the same time I was fortunate enough by the end to say I consider him a friend. One more, no, no, yeah. Yes, I read your Atlantic Monthly piece uh, before I came to, the, uh, to your talk, and I would like you to talk a bit more about sort of the hedonistic and wasteful life, uh, lifestyle of so many of us, and I, I include myself in it, and what it really takes to support that, and, and that includes uh, commitments and you know in service overseas that you know might not otherwise be necessary or at least quite as you know as, as, hmm. as uh, 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 taxing on you know on our on our on our resources hedonistic lifestyles all right <laughs> well this one time no um, you know what what I Again, I tried to keep politics out of this book, but one thing that really struck me during the political campaign, um, and I know it's politics, and believe me, I love politics, so I love the kind of blood sport back and forth, but nevertheless, when, um, what was the circumstances where Obama mentioned something about, well, we could, if people would inflate their tires to the proper pressure, uh, we would, you know, I forget the exact equivalent, but how much less we'd have to drill. And I remember the uproar about that, and. I actually heard from a couple of people saying, really, it's too much of a sacrifice to ask Americans to check their tire pressure while I'm, you know, <laughs> my eighth month in Iraq. Um, I, I don't know. I, I, I'm not one that, that comes down hard on the American people because, um, you know, I, I, think, uh, I think it really is difficult to, you know, uh, you know raise children and, and maintain a career and, and, and and be mindful of how you're impacting the rest of the world. But I do generally hear um, a desire to find a way to, uh, to impact the world in a more positive way. And I think what most people have been looking for is leadership to step up and say, great, here are five things we all need to be doing. You know, gung-ho is a national priority. Um, I don't know, maybe I'm naive to think that we're going to be able to accomplish that because we do still live in a... Uh, a partisan uh, world, but at the same time, I don't know that it all comes from government. Um, you know, again, a lot of the people that I asked those questions to pointed to World War II, and um, you know, my sort of pithy way of pointing this out is if you're an antique car collector, good luck finding, what, a 1944 Dodge to add to your collection, because there aren't any, because they were building tanks and airplanes. Um, and again, we, you know, well, actually, I, I shouldn't even say we don't need any vehicles, because um, you know, aren't we about to lose our auto industry? <laughs> and, you know, we had to wait so long to get MRAPs and other mine-resistant vehicles to Iraq. I mean, I, I don't know that any, anyone, I, you know, I'm not sure that's the best example, but here, here I'll give another one. Um, there's a scene in the book, Drew Sloan actually, is on a mission to a village in Afghanistan to um, basically to look for Taliban. And when his unit goes there, or the it's a, it's, a, it's a related unit to his. But when they go there, they have no knowledge that only a few months earlier, another U.S. Army was there, wound up getting in a firefight, losing one of their guys, and rounding up all the military-aged males in the village um, for, I think, about a day and a half. Don't quote me on that. But a significant amount of time trying to find out who were the ones that actually shot at them. Well, they have no idea about that background when they actually go into the same village, again, on the same mission looking for Taliban. And I thought, well, you know, I mean, from my phone in, that I'm, you know, sitting here with on, on the lectern, lectern, I could pull up, what, every, uh, you know, Barnes & Noble within a 50-mile radius of this locality here and press a couple buttons and find reviews of people, where's the best coffee or whatever. You, you know, my thought was, 
you're going to tell me there's no military Google Earth that they can just punch in and say, this village, OK? Um, but I, I wonder if, did we ever actually go to Google and say, hey, what could you guys develop for us that in a 21st century modern battlefield uh, our troops could be using? Um, I suppose that's a little bit of a simplif simplification, but I see and hear these things again and again and again. Um, you know, the other example I come up with is that when we, um, on 9-11, people were still buying CDs, right? And, uh, you know, has anyone in this room bought a CD in the last year? You know, because we've re revolutionized how everyone gets their music, but um, the primary patrol vehicle in Iraq and Afghanistan is still a Humvee that was designed in the mid-1980s, or before even designed prior to the mid-1980s. Um, so, I mean, I know that doesn't quite go to the hedonism, uh, but uh, I, I do think, you know, I, I, again, I think if we have a, if we treat, if we pay attention and think of these people as, even if they aren't technically our brothers and sisters, that they are, um, then maybe we'll be a little bit inspired to come up with these sort of outside improvements. Ladies and gentlemen, let's uh, give a round of applause to Bill Murphy. <laughs>